At this point, we've talked about what to do when we're trying to prove statements involving universal quantifiers and existential quantifiers. When we're proving a statement that begins with a universal quantifier, we need to use the principle of universal generalization, which says we need to introduce arbitrary variables. And when we're proving a statement that starts with an existential quantifier, we need to use the principle of existential generalization, which tells us we need to assign specific values to our variables. The next thing to look at is what happens when an assumption we make includes a quantified statement. In other words, what happens when we're assuming a real number exists, or what happens when we're assuming a statement is true for all real numbers. In these situations, there are two other logical principles that we need to appeal to. These are called the instantiation principles. We have existential instantiation when we're assuming something with an existential quantifier, and we have universal instantiation when we're assuming something with a universal quantifier. To begin, let's talk about the principle of existential instantiation. Suppose in our proof we've assumed a statement that begins with an existential quantifier. In other words, we've assumed a statement along the lines of there is at least one value of x in the real numbers for which some statement about x is true. The question is, how can we use this statement in our proof? How can we extract information from it? Now, if we think about it, all this statement is telling us is that somewhere in the vast list of real numbers out there, there is at least one that has this property, p of x. But the statement doesn't tell us which one. It only tells us that there is one. For this reason, we can't just choose our favorite value of x and assume that that's the one that works. So we can't, for example, say, since there is a real number x for which p of x is true, therefore p of 1 must be true. That doesn't work because all we know is that there is a real number that makes p of x true. We don't know that it's the number 1. We don't know what it is. And so all the principle of existential instantiation allows us to do is say, if there is at least one real number with a certain property, we can talk about that real number, but we have to talk about it without knowing what its value is. This means we have to talk about this real number as an unknown quantity. And so it allows us to introduce an unknown constant into our proof that has that property. In other words, if we assume there is at least one value of x with a certain property, we can introduce a line into our proof that says something like, let x represent a real number that has this property. When we do this, the value of x has to remain unknown. We can't assign a value of x because the statement that there is a value of x doesn't tell us what that value of x is. To see how this works in practice, let's look at an example. Let's prove the statement for all x and y in the real numbers. If there is at least one value of a in the real numbers that is larger than x and also smaller than y, then x must be smaller than y. This statement seems obvious to look at, but let's have a look at how we can prove it. To begin, since this is a statement about all real numbers x and y, we need to start by introducing arbitrary constants x and y into our proof. At this point, since we have a conditional statement, we need to make an assumption, and if we're using a direct proof, we assume the antecedent, which is the full statement, there is at least one value of a in the real numbers for which x is less than a and a is less than y. You'll notice that this assumption includes an existential quantifier, which means we're going to need to use the principle of existential instantiation. The principle of existential instantiation says that we know a value of a exists with this property, but we don't know what value of a that is. And so all we're allowed to do is introduce an unknown constant into our proof that represents the existing value. This means we can include a line that says, let a be a real number with x less than a and a less than y. We don't know what the value of a is, we're just saying that a represents some unknown real number that has this property. From here, we need to demonstrate the consequent of our conditional statement, which is that x is less than y. And this is a fairly easy demonstration. We have two inequalities, one that x is less than a, the other that a is less than y, and just by applying axiom O2, the transitivity axiom, we can conclude that therefore x is less than y. All that remains is our conclusions. We can say by the principle of conditional proof that if our antecedent is true, then our consequent follows, and since x and y were arbitrary, we can conclude that this is true for all x and y in the real numbers. Let's look at another example. <laughs> 
In this example, we're going to prove for all x in the real numbers, if there is at least one value of a in the real numbers, for which a is not equal to zero, and a times x is equal to a, then x must be equal to one. In other words, what we're showing is that if x behaves as a multiplicative identity for at least one non-zero real number a, then x must be the multiplicative identity, which is the number one. To begin the proof, since we're proving this is true for all values of x in the real numbers, we start by letting x be an arbitrary real number. Next, since we're proving a conditional statement, if we're using a direct proof, we assume that the full antecedent is true. In other words, we assume the statement, there is at least one real number a, for which a is not equal to zero, and a times x is equal to a. Since this assumption contains an existential quantifier, in order to use this assumption, we'll need to use the principle of existential instantiation. This means that since we know a value of a exists with this property, but we don't know what value of a exists, all we can do is introduce an unknown constant into our proof that represents the existing value. We do this by including a statement along the lines of, let a be an element of the real numbers for which a is not equal to zero and a times x is equal to a. Remember, we cannot assign a value to a because the value of a that exists is unknown. From this assumption, we're required to demonstrate that x is equal to 1. Again, this demonstration is going to be fairly easy. Starting with the equation a times x is equal to a, we can use the fact that since a is not 0, a has a multiplicative inverse. This means we can multiply the inverse of a on both sides of this equation. This gives us a inverse times ax is equal to a inverse times a. And since a inverse times a is 1, we get x is equal to 1, which is what we're trying to demonstrate. Of course, we're now able to make our conclusions by the principle of conditional proof. We can say that if our antecedent is true, then our consequent is true. And since x was an arbitrary real number, we can conclude that this is true for all values of x.